So we are live. Excellent. Excellent. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Scott Elkins. I'm a member of the board of directors for the Motorsport Safety Foundation, and this is one of our uh, what we typically have uh, monthly webinars. But we've been off a month, and now we're catching back up uh, right before the holiday season. And so um, the topic tonight is um, is a new instruction model, the on-off switch, and Tonight, we've got Ross Bentley, who everybody probably knows. Um, and Peter, I'm going to be honest, I can't remember your last name. I'm the worst host ever. <laughs> no, no, joint. You're in a, a, a legion of others. Um, it's, uh, my name's Peter Zabios. Uh, see, I never would have been able to pronounce that anyway. So that's perfect. Yeah, so that's perfect. Um, Ross, everybody knows who you are. We, we know what you're doing. Peter, you want to tell us uh, who you are and what, what, you, what you got going on with us tonight? Yeah, so um, I uh, about 18 months ago, I started uh, learning how to drive uh, cars on uh, racetracks. And I'm here to, to talk a little bit about my experience in the last 18 months, learning how to do that with a combination of schools and coaches and with this new Garmin Catalyst that I've been using for the last few months. Okay, perfect. Um, just as a few housekeeping reminders, everybody knows that um, this webinar, as all the other MSF webinars, are going to be is going to be posted on the MSF website. Uh, it'll also be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you or your friends want to watch it later uh, and don't get a chance to see it, uh, please know that. And then also, um, as a note, after uh, we go through kind of the presentation, uh, there'll be a Q and A at the end uh, tonight, so you guys can ask questions and talk about things. So, Ross, I hand it over to you. Okay, well, thanks, Scott. Um, actually, you know, I think going into the holidays, um, people are going to be binge watching the ah, MSS yes. webinars. I think, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, they're they're going to be watching the whole series, like a whole, like even better than Stranger Things. It's going to be amazing. Uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, you guys are out of business. It's MSF webinars. That's it going forward. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, so I'm uh, kind of excited about talking about this topic because I'm. Well, I'm passionate about this stuff, and I just think that we have an amazing opportunity right now. So I'm going to click on and going to start a little, show you a few slides here. Um, and uh, Peter and I will get rid of our little mug shots off the screen so you guys can focus on uh, just what's on the screen there. So, um, And what we're going to talk about is this new model for High performance driver education instruction, and you know, is, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time, uh, you know, talking about when we should talk about apexes or the line or weight transfer that kind of stuff. This is more of a big picture kind of stuff. But I'm really hoping that uh, everyone that's on this webinar is either an instructor or they're a chief instructor, event organizer. Uh, maybe they're thinking about becoming an instructor. Or I can pretty much guarantee that at some point, everybody that's on this webinar has been instructed. So uh, that's my assumptions going into this thing. And the goal here is to provide the kind of this new model or a new way of looking at, at HPD instruction overall. And then I'm going to pick on Peter and some of his recent experience. Having somebody who's really only gotten into the sport in the past couple of years, uh, but has... Uh, become pretty much addicted like the rest of us to it. Uh, I, I think it's going to be great to kind of see and hear Peter's experiences. So um, right now what I'm talking about here is the, the journey that students go through, through the whole high performance driver education program. And currently most, and, and by the way, I'm going to be, I'm going to be saying most a lot tonight because I'm going to say, most organizations do this. And every now and then somebody's going to go, oh, but we don't do that. That's okay. Uh, uh, part of this is to learn from other people's experiences. And most of what we're going to be talking about tonight are, are things that I have experienced or learned or stolen from other people as well. So what we're talking about is currently the model that we kind of have right now is kind of like an on off switch and i'll get into the details of that but basically it is we instruct we instruct we instruct now that student signed off they're solo see ya so it's on for instruction then off 
And again, I know that there are some organizations out there who do a little bit more in between, but most are, it's kind of an on off switch. And obviously what we're proposing is something new, which is more of a transition model. And that's what I'm gonna, first of all, just kind of present in a conceptual way. And then Peter and I will talk about that in a little bit more practical kind of way, I guess. Um, so let's look at the old model. And I'm gonna break this into two parts here. First of all, what happens before somebody gets to the track and then what happens once they do get to the track and on track. So there's the pre-track journey. And typically what happens is a student signs up, they register, maybe, maybe, just maybe, they do a little prep on their own. They read a book, they watch some YouTube videos, they show up with a little bit more understanding. And uh, I'd actually be interesting, I'd be interesting to know how many instructors on here right now have had the experience you're an instructor, you've had an experience where you've got two students, one of them shows up and they've done their homework. They know what an apex is. They understand the concept of a line. They even understand the difference between over, oversteer and understeer. And your other student goes, what's an apex? So uh, I'm pretty sure most of you who have had that experience kind of know that one is a whole lot easier to teach, to help, but more importantly, they have a better learning experience and it's much safer. So some students do a little self prep, some don't. So then they show up at the track and this is one of my, mm, I don't know, kind of, kind of uh, one of my pet peeves, I guess. And is think back to the first time that you went to the track your very first high performance driver education course, you showed up at the track and you're probably a little nervous. You're certainly anxious, you're excited. You're like, ah, I'm gonna get to drive on the track, yay. And you show up and somebody says, okay, go over into that classroom and you'll be in there for an hour or 45 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever. And you go into that classroom in that room and you go, hmm, that's not what I signed up for. And you hear other cars on track and you're excited, again, you're nervous, you're anxious, all these kind of feelings, right? So you've got an instructor up at the front of the room and I would say that instructor might be fantastic. They might be a great communicator. They might be a great teacher in a way they're describing the different concepts you need to learn and maybe very engaging, but not all of them are like that. Some of them may not be and uh, some of you may have had the experience of having an instructor who mm, maybe wanted to share a lot of their own experiences and maybe talked over the head of most students in the room, especially when those students are already maybe not totally engaged because their mind is already on the track and what they're going to do. And so that at track classroom session becomes mm, less than ideal. It's a less than ideal learning experience. So, uh, it, you know, that student then finally gets out of the classroom, they get in the car, the in-car instructor starts talking to them about the line and the apex and weight transfer, and the student's kind of looking with them, looking at the instructor with a blank stare going, uh, what, uh, what's, that, what's an apex? Because they didn't hear it. And maybe even worse than that is you've got a student who, they see a yellow flag and the instructor says, there's a yellow flag and the student going, yeah, but because they didn't hear some of the safety, the, the safety briefing parts of this. So um, that's a very typical experience. Now, again, some of you might be saying, oh yeah, but we do something here and we do something there and great, fantastic. But I'm gonna encourage you to think about maybe some other things as well. So let's look at, at what could be a new model for the pre-track journey. And, you know, once again, there's a registration that happens. Some organizations are doing a fantastic job with the welcome part of this. And that welcome part of it is, you know, it's the uh, first impressions part of this, right? You know, you make a good first impression, it makes all the difference for the experience the student has. That welcome may include, and uh, we're recommending that it includes introducing 
the student to their instructor they're going to have at the track at that upcoming event. And then that instructor become starts uh, begins some communication with the student, starting to understand for w some information about the student's vehicle, uh, maybe their driving experience, what their objectives are, what they're looking for, maybe even find a little bit about, you know, how they've learned in the past, some of the other activities they've been involved in, and turning that around and getting a student to ask the instructor so that you start to build this relationship and the trust that, that is so important in that kind of a learning environment uh, begins. So that's a critical, critical part of this pre-track journey. If you're not doing that now, I would highly, well, we would highly recommend that you start that. The next step is, is starting to recommend some pre, some self prep uh, resources. And, you know, again, rather than leaving it up to the student th to have them go search around on YouTube, sending them a list of here are the best YouTube videos to watch. Uh, it could be specific to the track or maybe something about learning driving technique or something like that. Sending them, you know, a track map, uh, giving them some recommended reading, things like that. So helping the student uh, prepare on their own, but giving them the resources to do that. You know, we all know that the best learning experience is not to dump a pile of information on somebody all at one time. We all know that the best way that we learn, the best way that anybody learns is when it's dripped out to them, you know, in, in small little bites. And I'm going to say that this is something that, you know, if you really start to look into and research and study a little bit, um, you know, the different in, in differences in generations and how they learn, you know, millennials, uh, it, it's much more important that they learn in smaller bites just because of their the way they've grown up and the culture they've grown up in. Everything is in faster moving, it's in little bites and things. So um, taking the opportunity to start to introduce a lot of the educational part of what they learn in the classroom session before they even get to the track. So it could be an e-course, it could be simply a, uh, a curriculum designed around specific resources and giving them that information, but trickle that information out over time rather than boom, dump all this on, on the student at one time. If it can be experienced and used and learned uh, on a phone, on a tablet, even better. Because as we all know that that's how we spend most of our life these days. And now when we're sitting somewhere, you know, or the, the student is sitting somewhere and they've got 10 minutes, they could pull up their phone and they can go through some stuff and start to learn and prepare. So, that, so they're preparing before they even get to the track. So now when they get to the track and they're sitting in the classroom, the classroom session takes on a different experience. And rather than a, we're going to dump a lot of information on you, it's, we're going to focus on the operations of the event, you know, where the pre-grid is, what time you need to be here, when a driver's meeting is going to be, the schedule, that kind of thing. And uh, the most important safety things, going over a review, a review of the flags so that everybody is very, very clear on what those flags mean. And then the, the part of the learning process around line, seating position, you know, uh, weight transfer, all those different kinds of things that we all want to share with our students um, becomes more of a discussion and a review rather than a, let me dump a lot of information on you. So I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll leave this new model of the pre-track journey there for you to think about. And by the way, all of this information will be available afterwards as well. Um, but that's the pre-track journey. And you can see, I mean, it's not difficult. All of this stuff is fairly easy to do. So that's the recommendation for the new model there. In terms of the on-track journey, the actual driving on-track part of this, you know, the, the old model has been on, in-car instruction, off, signed off solo. And, you know, that in-car instruction may last half a day, it may last 12 days, whatever. That the student goes through that in-car instruction for some period of time until 
they the instructors or chief instructor has said okay that driver is ready to be signed off for solo and they now drive on the track by themselves so that is the on off switch right there now some may you know there's some instructors and hopefully i mean great instructors do periodic kind of check-ins with their students even though they've been signed off they go back and help them a little bit and check in with them some students request some additional instruction so there is some of that and i know that goes on a lot um but maybe not encouraged enough. And then it's left up to the self-learning part. And I, I've been involved with a number of surveys and uh, discussions with groups of HPDE drivers, it, it's students. And the single biggest reason why somebody is in our sport for a period of time and then leaves is they get to a point and they kind of plateau and they go, you know, I just don't seem to be, I don't seem to be improving. Uh, I think I've, I think I've learned everything there is to know about driving. No, they, they kind of get to that point where they're frustrated and they plateaued at that point. And unless we give them some reason to keep coming back, a lot of them leave, they go play golf or whatever, right? And that tends to be the model that most organizations have been using for, I'm gonna say decades now. And again, I will admit, I have seen some organizations who do a fantastic job of enhancing this. And that's what's led to this idea of, of a new model. And the new model looks something like this. I'm not saying it's exactly like this, but these are many of the components or steps in this new model. In-car instruction. While there's been a lot of discussion, especially this year, around do we really need to be in the right seat or left seat, depending on which country you're in, uh, uh, in, in the passenger seat with students while they careen around the racetrack with us holding on and going, break, break, break. Um, uh, you know, do we need to be doing that? I still believe that for a novice student, it is the most efficient, safest way of introducing track driving. It's not the only way, uh, but in the very beginning, and that very beginning could last very, very short period of time or longer period of time. But that's that. That's a. I'm going to say that's the first step. Obviously, this year we've had our challenges with that, with the pandemic. But we'll talk more about that as we go along here. One of the areas that that is definitely underrated and underused is having students and or instructors go to corners and observe and providing feedback. Some of the most valuable learning that I did as a driver and understand that was about 650 years ago, I think, is when I started. Um, at, least, at least that's what it feels like. And uh, But one, some of the most valuable learning experience that I had was when I would go out to a corner and with, with an instructor and we would watch. And the instructor would say, what do you see that driver doing? Or, hey, what do you, what'd you notice there? And the making me think um, was so valuable, such a, an important part of it. And I understand that from a scheduling perspective, it's a challenge. It really is. It's a challenge to figure out how can we get students out to the corners and back. Depends on the track. Some some tracks are very easy. Just walk down the end of the paddock and there's a corner they can observe at. Other tracks is not like that. And so I understand it's a challenge, but that's all it is. It's a challenge. It can be figured out. Something else that, that I'd say the very best organizations that I see uh, do is having these small group debriefs or coaching sessions. And, you know, it could be the entire run group or it could be one instructor taking four drivers and having like a little mini debrief with them. Or it could be, you know, just a small group that's going to work on one part or one specific technique. But having these small little group debriefs and again, I know some of you are going, you know, yeah, but have you ever tried to figure out the schedule to make that work? I know I had to do that. It's it's a challenge. But again, I just look at it as it's a challenge. And sometimes if you give an instructor, you give three or four or six instructors at your event and say, I challenge you to take small groups of drivers and do little mini brief debriefs with them. Uh, they'll find a way. Next step, lead follow. Now, that has been an interesting topic this year, hasn't it? Uh, we have, we, MSF, we did a two webinars, one at the end of May and one in the middle of June, 
specifically just about using lead follow because of the restrictions we had and the limitations we had in terms of doing in-car instruction this year. And I can tell you my experience of traveling around the country since the end of May, and I have been around, I've been on a plane just about every single week since the end of May. And so I've been around the country. I've met a lot of instructors. I've met a lot of drivers and a lot of organizations. And the overwhelming response has been, wow, lead follow really does work. And it worked a lot better than I thought it did. And yes, there have been some challenges with it, but man, we figured it out. And it's to the point where even when we're the, you know, COVID is gone and we don't have to worry about being in car, we're continuing to use lead follow. It's become a new tool in our toolbox. Yes, I'd be lying if I didn't say or admit that I've seen people make comments, mostly on social media saying, oh, lead follow doesn't work. Uh, yeah. And I, I just, um, well, I've had only a couple of conversations around that where I've asked the question, how much have you used it? And they will, well, we tried it once for 30 minutes and it didn't work. Okay, come on. Uh, the, the very first time you did in-car instruction for the first 30 minutes, did it work perfectly? I doubt it. So it takes some effort. It, it's, it's a new skill and it's something that you need to continue to learn and practice. And yes, there is a coordination piece and there's a lot of, um, and actually I'm, I'm not gonna go too much further on that because I know Peter's got some great stories about that. So here is one of the big kind of transition moments here. And then maybe the most important part here is at that point, you know, we, we've got a couple of options. We can say to a student, at that point, they may be ready to be signed off and go solo. But we also have technology today that can help us. And, you know, I'm going to specifically talk about using the, the new Garmin Catalyst because I have used it a lot in the past few months. I know a lot of instructors who have used it a lot in the past few months. And it is, as far as I know, the only tool that can do what it does in terms of providing audio coaching cues while driving on the track. There are other tools out there that can help in terms of, you know, um, uh, 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 predictive lap time and things like that, but that's really not what we want in that HPDE world. So at this point, and, and I'm, I'm gonna use a little uh, scenario anal analogy here, and let's say that you're an instructor and you've got two students. You've got Sally and you've got Bill, your two students. You know, Sally, she's aware, She's safe, she's a good driver, but you know, she needs to work a little bit on her line and a little bit on the braking technique. She's still got a little of those things. Like you kind of want to go, she can go solo, but she really needs some continued coaching to work with her a little bit more. You've got Bill who have got some good skills, but a little aggressive and you're just not really comfortable signing Bill off yet to solo on his own, get out there on his own. Maybe not totally aware enough, that kind of stuff. So you're not really comfortable with that. What you'd like to be able to do is spend more time in the car with Bill and less time in the car with Sally and doing more kind of the in-between session uh, coaching and debriefing with Sally. The great thing is you could take a Garmin Catalyst, put it in the car with, with Sally and have Sally be coached by the Catalyst and know that, again, we'd have no absolutes in this business, but you feel comfortable that she's not going to do anything dangerous and the catalyst is going to be able to coach her along the way. So we have a tool now that can help us do part of our job. It's not going to replace us, absolutely not, but it's a tool that can help enhance what we do. And in this point now, we're, we're kind of in this place where it's not an on-off switch. We're kind of transitioning from that in-car through to using lead follow, debriefs, technology, and eventually getting to solo. And then of course, they get into the requested instruction and periodic in-car checks, maybe some very specific one-on-one -on -one coaching, then maybe some very advanced data video coaching, and then you know the self-learning and mentoring part. And some organizations I've seen are doing a fantastic job with the mentoring part. You know, they're, they're, they're uh, matching drivers and instructors up and having an instructor work and kind of be a mentor to that driver for a long period of time to the point where that driver, that student driver becomes, starts to become a mentor for the next round of drivers. 
And if you look at this model, to me, one of the main things it does and the differences it, uh, it provides from the on-off model is the culture. The culture here is constant learning, constant improvement. There is always more. It goes around and around and around and around. In fact, starts to come back around to perhaps where they start to instruct and mentor the next group. If you look at the old model, it kind of says you need to be instructed, you need to be instructed, you need to be instructed, you no longer need to be instructed. And I think as a culture, it sends, well, it sends the wrong message. So this new model really helps build that culture around constant improvement. We're here to always learn. And now we're transitioning rather than going from on to off. So we have two big opportunities. Opportunity one is the pre-track preparation part. Opportunity two is the on-track learning transition. And thinking about it as two opportunities and going, yes, as an organization, as an instructor, as a chief instructor, as a whatever here, uh, I've got two opportunities to take our program to the next level. And again, I know there are some that got very high level already. Come on, there's always more. Benefits uh, to me, there well, there's three big benefits here. And you know, the first one is just it provides a better learning experience. You look at those models and you cannot, I, I, I challenge you to come up with a reasoning that this is not going to be a better learning experience for students. And after all, isn't that why we're here? Two, it can actually provide a better student instructor ratio. Going back to my, my story with Sally and Bill, you know, now rather than instructor having to be in the car with two students all the time, now maybe we've got an instructor who can spend more time with one student, a little bit less time with the other student using the technology piece. And, uh, and, and that allows us to kind of actually free up uh, the manpower, deploy the manpower in different ways. And I know, well, I don't know of, a, of an HPDE organization out there that says, yeah, we have too many instructors. Most of them are saying, ah, if we could get more instructors and maybe more quality instructors, uh, then, then we can do more. So this can actually help with that. And the third, and after all, the most important thing, it, it's, this is a safer way of doing things, you know, rather than a, I hate to say it, but I am going to say it. There are organizations, there are instructors who get to the point where it's like, I'm just going to sign this driver off to solo. You know, either I don't feel safe riding with them, so I'm just going to sign them off and they can go drive on their own. Or organizations saying, come on, get them through on solo here. Get them into solo because we need to have those instructors working with somebody else. That's not safe. That's not the way we should be doing this. So those are the benefits. Okay. So Peter, I'm going to ask you to click on your camera and let's uh, both put our little ugly mugs back on the screen here. And I'm going to ask you just to kind of quickly tell a few stories about your experience in the past couple of years, specifically about your journey before you even got to the track. What what out of these out of this model has worked and what have you went, oh, I wish that would have been there or could have been done better? Well, I think he summarized a lot of what uh, what I went through. I um, I went through um, HPE school at the performance school up in um, Seattle that Don Kitch runs, and ahead of that, I uh, got the Lost Art of High Performance Driving book, and I read that, um, and then I got communications from the school about what to expect and how to prepare myself, and pre-reading. Um, and then it, it went a, a lot of the way you described, you know, the first thing we did was go into the classroom and Don, uh, you know, reinforced a lot of the principles that we covered in the pre-reading, you know, and then we went out on the track to develop skills and came back, you know, in for instruction, um, you know, and then by the end of the day, you know, we were doing, uh, you know, spending most of my time on the track. And did have you know a follow up session where um, I went out and with an instructor in the right seat, and spent time with him to the point where he felt comfortable signing me off to go solo. And um, you know I had grown up loving sports cars, had never been on a racetrack before, 
And uh, going out, uh, you know, being released onto the track was pretty intimidating because you know, we're sharing the track with a bunch of sport drivers out there. And I, I definitely remember what it was like to be passed going into turn three by a Lamborghini, um, you know, and it was all done safely, but, you know, two feet long, two foot long flames shoot out of the back of both those exhaust pipes as that car is braking. And it's just a lot, it's really overwhelming. Um, so, you know, I, I continued to go back to the track and practice what I learned, but, uh, you know, it's all, what did I remember from my class? What notes did I take? You know, I'm, I'm taking, I'm keeping track notes. I'm preparing before I go on the track. I'm debriefing myself afterwards. But a lot of that is an exploration kind of on your own. And I did hire coaches uh, about every six to eight sessions. And just for some context, I started, uh, I went to the um, uh, school in March of 2019. And in 2019, I had a little over 300 laps across a couple of the tracks in the Northwest. And this year, uh, I've driven 600 or more laps and um, tracks in the Northwest, as well as Thunder Hill and uh, Button Willow down in California. Um, so every six to eight sessions, I would get a coach and the coach would sit in the car with me and then provide a ton of input and direction. Uh, and when I uh, talk to them before we get in the car, I'd say, you know, I'm the kind of person that processes information very sequentially and incrementally. So it would be overwhelming to be given so much input about you know, break here, apex late, you know, track out more at every single turn. But eventually I would process all that and my, you know, I'd get better and better. Um, but I think the single best thing that happened to me as a driver this year uh, were two things and they both begin with C. Uh, one was COVID and one was the catalyst. Uh, COVID? Because, <laughs> yes, because COVID meant that I couldn't have a coach in the right seat. Oh. And that introduced me to a whole different way of instruction that actually helped me it suited me better because now what we did um, you know in some cases i had coaches that put smarty cams in my car in some cases uh, actually a button well i had this awesome coach kevin madsen who put a live video camera in my car and i had a microphone and the, so he could see what i was doing and give me real-time feedback but um, now when i'm driving you know, we sit down before I get in the car and have a pretty deep conversation about what are the objectives for the day? What are the three things I'm going to try and do? Um, and I go out on the track and the coach is observing me from, you know, a tower or a corner. And, um, and then I come back in after six to eight laps and we debrief again and, you know, either decide to stick with the three objectives or we come up with some other ones. But that really helps helped me a lot because the way I learn, um, I want to take some input. I want to go work on it. I want to come out, talk about it, and then get some more input. So just if, if that had been all I did this year, COVID helped me tremendously make better use of the coaches I was hiring and, and helped improve my ability to learn and apply what I learned on the track. But, um, you so know, I listened to Peter, can yeah, I just, go ahead, Russ. can I just ask you to, to clarify something? So, not having an instructor in the car with you actually helped you learn more is what I'm hearing you say. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, when I went to button willow for the first time, I hired a, a really fantastic coach there and but this was, you know, way before COVID and we walked the track in the morning, which was great. Um, but then with him in the car, um, it was, it's just overwhelming to be given so much specific direction, you know, so frequently and you're driving really fast and, you know, your, your tension is, is rising. Uh, but I knew enough about myself to be able to say, you know, it's going to take me probably half the day to internalize most of what you're saying. And then the second half of the day, you know, I can then start thinking about how do we improve on it. But yeah, it's a lot of input to process at, at a time when you're also as a new driver, super nervous, driving a car faster than you probably ever have in your life, um, uh, and then trying to process all that information. And and did you um, experience lead follow? Yeah. So actually, the, I had an awesome experience with lead follow, both 
um, with the instructor ahead of me where I was following him. And then when the instructor would follow me, mostly because it was a great way to see the line and, and cu that coupled with a track walk, I could start like when I was following, it helped me shift a lot of my focus off of where am I going? Um, I'm still concerned about that, but oh, did I, am I picking up that scene in the pavement where I need to make sure I turn in? Am I picking up that reference point about where I'm going to track out and where the apex is? So it, that helped me really understand the line in a, in a constructive way. So when I went back out on the track, I'd internalized a lot more of that and then could be thinking about, okay, what am I trying to do in this turn now? Right. So uh, I'm going to ask everyone, if you're looking at that on the screen and you're seeing the, the second step of corner observation slash feedback, pretend it also says track walk there, because that's actually kind of a different way of looking at corner observation as well. That could be a, a track walk. So. So, yeah, so COVID actually helped you in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if, if, if uh, the catalyst had never shown up, it, it totally changed how I worked with, with the coaches I had and uh, have. And uh, that's been, that was transformational. But then along the way, um, like I drive, my home tracks are all up in the Northwest. And I intellectually, I know, hey, when it's raining, that's the day to go to the track. And I would sign up for those track days and I'd, you know, be out there driving in the rain, not really knowing what I was doing, like knowing this is a great way to test and find the limit at a much lower speed. But it's still like uh, the coaches I talk to now, um, I feel like, uh, you know, I can learn the line pretty quickly. My fundamentals are pretty good. I'm pretty smooth. And it's just conquering fear. And what I was in a rut with rain days because I still was struggling to conquer the fear. Um, and about this time, I got the um, I got a Garmin Catalyst. And, and Peter, I'm going to stop you yeah. right there because there's a question, and I think more than one question, say, saying, "What is a Garmin Catalyst?" Um, oh. it, if you haven't seen the device yet, it's a device that Garmin, the company that you know does aviation and boat and running gear and all that kind of stuff. Uh, have developed for motorsport and it came out September 1st. It was launched and it's a tool that you basically mount in your car. It's got a camera, it's got GPS, it's got accelerometers and then, and it can actually provide you feedback on, on uh, basically tells you how to access and get to your optimal lap. And it coaches you on that. It doesn't tell you to do ever to do something that you haven't already done to some extent. So it's just another tool in, People have said, well, it's another data device. It's actually not, it's a, it's a whole different category. So I'm not gonna get into a sales pitch here, but it's, uh, I just say, you know, go on and do a Google search for Garmin Catalyst. And uh, if you're not familiar with it yet. Sorry, Peter, go yeah, ahead. No, no, that's a great way. That's a really important point. Yeah, so what, for me, what this does is it gives me a device, it's got a big screen. So I mount it so that I can see it out of my peripheral vision. Um, and it, it, it's got super sensitive GPS, so it can tell if you're a foot off the apex or not. Um, and, it, and it records everything you're doing, and then it looks at, you know, for this turn of the 15 times you've done it, what was your fastest one? And then um, when you're not driving it like that, it'll, it'll coach you on how to drive it that way. So, um, and the coaching is in, is in two forms. One, there's a robot in it. There's an AI engine. And uh, there's a voice that will tell you um, as you're approaching a turn, you know, break later or apex earlier or, um, you know, break harder or break softer, track out further. And uh, it, it doesn't do this on every turn. It only does it in the turns where you're asking it to help you. So you're not overwhelmed with feedback, uh, but what it does do on every turn is on this big display, it'll show you in big, uh, against a green background or a red background, how are you tracking against your best lap? And I used to, you know, I've listened, I listened to lots of podcasts and, you know, I, I uh, go and like I'll watch Ross's track walks with Peter Krause and they'll talk about, you know, you need to just roll another one mile an hour into this turn. 
and that's the, the, the key. And I'm like, oh, how, how in the heck can I tell what that is? And with this device, I can go into a turn and come out of it and it'll tell me you lost two tenths of a second on that turn um, in big red, or it'll tell you you gained a tenth of a second and then cumulatively through this. So it gave me fine grain uh, uh, control of my driving that I just never imagined I'd get. Um, and where it's so that there's a uh, like my home track is Pacific Raceway. I you know I drive it all the time. So having that with me, it helps me improve my performance. The first two times I used it at Pacific Raceway, my my best lap time dropped a second each time I used it. But where I found it to be really helpful is in giving me confidence to do new things. And so the first time I used the Garmin Catalyst at a rain day at Pacific Raceway, um, it helped me push my performance. It helped me break the front and rear end loose more than a dozen times, not in a wild way. I was able to catch them every time, but it, it actually, for the first time, gave me this sense of, oh, here's the limit in turn two. You know, and I can feel, you know, how I'm approaching it. I can feel where, the, where I got grip, where I don't have grip. Um, so it, it was able to give me confidence to push myself in a situation where historically I'd been really hesitant. And then when I go to new tracks, like when I was at uh, Thunder Hill in August, we had a two day uh, track event there. I had a uh, coach with me the first day and the second day, um, the catalyst helped me um, uh, take what I had learned and talked about and then apply it in a way to build on that and improve it. And actually I said Thunder Hill, I meant Oregon Raceway Park. Um, and then uh, I was just at Button Willow for the first time last week for two days. And I had uh, that coach uh, the first day. And then the second day, the catalyst helped me build on what I had learned and gave me confidence to drive that track uh, and push myself harder than I would have if I hadn't had it there because it can tell me you know, on a turn by turn basis, what, where can you get more? Where have you shown you can get more? How can you be more consistent with it? That's something else it does. It will also tell you, here's your best lap. Um, of your best laps, um, what kind of variance have you had? How consistent are you? And then it, since it has a video camera, um, it can take all the laps you drove that day and it will produce your best virtual app and stitch all the video together so that you can then use that as a way to visualize, you know, if I was driving my best that day, um, this is how I would get another second or two seconds out of my lap time. So to me, it's this, it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful augment and sort of additive asset to my coaches that I hire and work with. Um, it's a way to give me sort of continuous improvement. It gives me confidence when I'm doing something new or I'm at a new track. And, um, you know, it's at the point where, uh, and I've got a solo data, uh, solo two, uh, that, that helps me get really super granular about analyzing what I'm doing. But it's one of these tools that has opened up a whole new dimension of how do I get enjoyment out of driving my car fast um, without a lot of anxiety going with it. So it, it, um, to what you were talking about earlier, Ross, it, it is this way of putting someone on a track and helping them learn and helping them be safer as they learn, but also giving them a much richer relationship with the coaches that they work with. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a game changer for me. Okay. Uh, and somebody had asked, uh, what do you drive? I've seen, I've seen your, uh, your, uh, your older BMW 2002 TII, which is just one beautiful, beautiful car. And then uh, most of your track stuff now is in a Porsche Boxster, right? It's in, a, it's, in a, it's in a Cayman that Cayman, uh, uh, always buys someone else's project, but I bought it from a guy who um, modified it heavily for the track with a 3.8 right. and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it, it, it really goes. Right. So, uh, you know, to me, the um, w w what I'm hearing and why we, you know, why I asked you to be on here is because I've seen you experience, um, 
you know, all of these different components, you know, the in-car, uh, you know, track walks, uh, small groups, lead follow, using technology. Uh, you've asked for more coaching. You know, you've, you've used advanced data and video and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I think the progression um, you've made is, uh, you know, is, is a you know, part, part of it is a factor of the fact that you didn't just have somebody in the right seat telling you how to drive. And, and again, I'm not trying to say that that's bad in any ways, but I just think that the more we kind of open up and we look at the more different ways we can interact with our, with our students and uh, the, the better the learning experience is going to be for them. Um, you know, one of the, one of the concerns a lot of people have is how do we get new people into the sport? Um, I, I can tell you from being at some events where there are younger people at the events, the last thing in the world they want is another old guy like me, uh, I'm sitting in the right seat telling them what to do. The more we can uh, integrate different ways of them learning, the better it is. They, it's just, it's all around better learning experience. So, um, hey, with that, um, I'm sure we've got some questions and things and Scott, do you wanna jump back in and um, you're, you're, you're in charge of Q&A? You can yeah, no problem. Questions now. Yeah, exactly. I've been keeping up with stuff, and um, I just want to throw something out there. I've been watching all the comments and, and paying attention. I mean, this is really about a model. Um, we've had a couple of comments where guys are going, "Hey, this is a commercial for Garmin." No, mm -hmm. it's not a commercial for Garmin. Um, not at all. I mean, a lot of guys are mentioning Apex Pro. Uh, Andrew Rains is a really good friend yeah. of MSF, uh, as they say, friend of the show. So we're just using Peter's. A singular example in, in the product that he happened to use. We're not pitching anything. It's about technology and it's about using technology after that solo step. Um, it's also not about, you know, everybody talks about lap times, but I think, you know, as part of the education process, um, you know, a lot of guys are saying, well, lap times aren't, aren't allowed in HPDE. Well, part of the education process is learning how you get better. And unfortunately, when you're driving a car, part of that is about going through and going faster and having a good time. Everybody's got their own goals and things to achieve. And that's something that I think, you know, obviously every instructor needs to have that conversation with their student about what the goals are. And if their goals are to go fast, that's different than if their goals are to have a good time. So um, a lot of, a lot of good comments there, but um, you know, let's not, let's not get lost in where we are. We're trying to talk about a, a particular um, philosophical change, not necessarily selling garments. That's not, believe me, that's not our intention by any means. So uh, I just thought, I thought that was important to throw that out there. So um, a couple of really good comments, especially when you were talking about, um, talking about at the beginning, um, Wendy mentioned that, you know, prepping a student, she started having Zoom calls, which we're all doing these days um, with the students prior uh, and going over things. And then um, Paul mentioned that, you know, he thinks the pre-call is a great idea, but a lot of times you don't know who your student is. So that makes it really, really complicated and difficult to do that pre-call. Um, and, and Scott, just on that point, I know that, you know, some organizations, they don't assign instructors until the day of the event. And some are, you know, they're, they're assigning it beforehand. And obviously, you know, as an event organizer, the sooner you can assign the instructor to the student and vice versa, um, yep. the sooner they can start that connection. And, and, you know, again, is it a challenge? And I know that there are a lot of people that are doing this strictly on a volunteer basis. And the idea that, man, I got to do that on my one day off a week, you know, that's a tough thing. But, you know, if we want the, the best learning experience for the student and the safest learning experience for the student, that's one of the things we need to look at. Yeah, exactly. So let's jump into some of the questions. Um, uh, Daniel asked the question that, you know, when, you, when you're starting out with the student and you're trying to introduce this new model to the pre, kind of the pre-event, he's like, how in the world do you get the student to read the welcome packet? Like, how do you, how do you get them to, to pay attention to that? And that's almost an impossible question, but I think it's a good one to, to talk through. Yeah, impossible. <laughs> no. Uh, so, so, yeah, great point. And I'd say one of the things is uh, the more we can do with video, you know, there are some tools out there now that, you know, when somebody registers, you get like a little ping and you can immediately, you could just on your phone, you can go, hey, Daniel, uh, you know, really looking forward to working with you this coming Saturday. Um, hey, a couple things I'd ask you to do before we get here. This, this, and 
you know, it's easy to it's easy to kind of skim through or hit delete on an email. If you get that little video message like that, that's really that's going to have a bigger impact. Again, is it a little bit more work to set up in the beginning? Yes. Is it a whole lot better uh, experience for the for the student? Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the things. And, you know, I think. Uh, are, are we going to get every single student? show up and having done their homework? No. If we could get 90% of them, 75% of them? Yeah. Wow, that would be a big impact. And and I'm, I'm, I'm confident you can get that that percentage. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, ben, ben made the statement and, you know, he's like, hey, he's like, I'm from Northern California. Uh, I'm, I'm with a task of, of leading some guys for our SECA licensing school. And he's like, you know, how, how do we pull a lot of this stuff off in the t in the days of COVID? And I think, you know, I think that question comes up all the time and it's something we've tried to cover in the lead follow webinars that we've done and some of the other topics that we've tried to cover, you know, posting stuff to our website. Um, it's not easy, right? No, it, if it was easy, everybody would do it. No, <laughs> uh, but, exactly. you know, and, and I would say that if you're an event organizer, like it sounds like, uh, who was it? Was it Ben? Was it you just said? Um, yeah, Ben, Ben, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, ben, I, you know, if you're an event organizer, I think, you know, these are, it's like, like anything. Um, you know, I use the example all the time of the, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? You know, don't kind of go, okay, we're going to just completely revamp this entire thing and start from, no, add one little bit to it. You know, if you could just simply, for an example, start introducing, assigning uh, instructors to students earlier, getting them to start to communicate beforehand, add that little bit. And then maybe at the track, start to rather than if you've been using some lead follow and some in car, don't get rid of one of them. Just start to incorporate it, integrate it into that. You know, if you've got a data system uh, review part of a briefing, that kind of thing at some point, you know, just just start to incorporate little bits and pieces of it. And I think if at, at if you start off with that model and you've got that as a as a vision. And then you start picking off little pieces of it and just adding little bits of it over time. And someday you're going to go, hey, wait a minute, we're there. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's hit on this. I think it's important. And, and again, you know, as part of the topic, but a lot of guys are bringing up the topic that HPDE are specifically non-timed events. So incorporating technology into a quote unquote non-timed event um, seems to be a little bit of a gray area. Well, I, I would... Um, <laughs> That often I hear people say, oh, you know, we're not allowed to use timers because of insurance reasons. I have asked that reason, asked that question of insurance people, and never once have they said, oh, yeah, you're not allowed to do that. Now, if you're relying on your personal uh, insurance policy when you go to the track, it's probably invalid anyways. So uh, yeah. whether you're timing or not timing, uh, I don't know of a you know, just about every single standard policy that you have for your road car um, is thrown out the window if they really truly know what's going on in the track. So there is that. Um, I'd say the other part of that, the flip side of that is who doesn't have a smartphone these days? Yeah. And every smartphone has got some form of timer on it. And I've seen people who are like, you know, we don't do any timing here. Well, what's that phone doing? It's time in my laps, you know. Um, I think, you know, one of the one of the things that when we get into the technology part of it, it's less to me, it's less about the lap time. It's more about consistency. And when we can start to measure consistency, that is a super valuable part of it. And so I think that's, you know, how I would address the, the lap time thing. Um, I think every organization really needs to take a serious look at their at the insurance that and be honest and upfront with participants about whether their insurance really truly is uh, valid on the track and yeah. whether the lap timing has any impact on that. Yeah, I think I think it's probably one of those situations where, um, you know, in, in the racing world where I come from, you know, I, I think what everybody's talking about not having is, you know, and I'll do this with my fingers, a timed event. Whereas you you run lap times and publish lap times and everything like that, I think that's probably what most people are referring to because we're we, you know we're we're the ones that always always try to you know push the fact that the E in HPDE is about education. 
yep. and it's about learning and it's about teaching. And so part of that is, you know, it is, it is a really good metric of knowing whether you're better or not, if you're a little bit faster through a corner. So I think that's probably what the, the general, the yeah. general gist is that it's not a timed event, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, where does the and, and good question and it came up actually when peter was talking about his experience but where does the where does the quote unquote follow lead where the coach is actually following you come into the model because peter actually noted that that was a really good experience of his well uh, uh I, I, actually peter what was your experience when were, where was it in your learning learning uh journey where that was valuable for the instructor to turn around the other way let me ask that question. Well, when he, uh, we got to the point where uh, we both felt, okay, I, I think I've learned the line. Uh, now we're working on some key points. Like, am I using all of the track? Um, you know, am I approaching this turn and turning in at the right point? And then he would just get behind me and he would get my blind spot. So I wasn't seeing him as easily. And I would try and drive naturally and comfortably. Um, and then he would just observe me. So we could then, go back in and debrief and he would ask me like you know did you how far out did you track out and i would say i, I think i went all the way to the edge he's like you know actually no no i was you, you think you did but you you were way inside so he could come back and say you know going back to the three priorities you know the next session out there you got to use more of the track you know coming out of turn one and setting yourself up for turn two or whatever so it was mostly a way for him to get some dynamic visual uh, confirmation of where I was in my progression that day. And, and my follow on with that, with that would be, yeah, it's an instructor judgment call. Uh, you know, you can't say, well, it's after six laps or 60 laps or whatever. There's a judgment call that an instructor needs to make. Just like if an instructor is in the car, you know, there's a point as an in-car instructor where you're giving a lot of verbal direction. And then there's a point in time as an in-car instructor where you start to give less. And then there's a point in time where you might say to the student, you talk me around the track. That judgment call as an instructor is no different than making that judgment call as, okay, I'm gonna lead you and I'm watching what you're doing. And you know what, now I'm gonna let you go in front of me and I'm gonna follow you. So it's, it's, it's part of that judgment call of being a great instructor. I wish there was a simple, it's always on lap 18. <laughs> you know, um, Elliot Forsyth just made a comment, which um, I recognize Elliot because he's just signed up for our certified program. Um, he made a comment that it's really good if the coach or instructor can video when they're following the student and use that video to show the student um, afterwards. It'd be a really powerful tool. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. More the better. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, that's all the questions I had written down, Russ. I don't, I don't know if I hit them all or if I missed some of them. It was they were coming in fast and furious there for a minute. Yeah, uh, my lovely assistant has been uh, making many notes, and there's a bunch of them here. Uh, Excellent. Uh, for, uh, uh, Mike had said, you know, some organizations have been introducing the pre-event communication, but what I've found is that I've not been able to reach the student, maybe due to spam filters or something. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, not sure what uh, what we can do about that, but um, you know the fact that you're actually reaching out that proves to me that you're trying to be a, the best instructor you can. Um, uh, let's see, let me just try to get through the ones we haven't already touched on. Um, just touch on that one. Uh, there's one that just popped up, Ross. Um, there's one that uh, from Rowan who says he he's spoken to you a couple of times about driver aids and about the whole technological race, and like what what kind of what kind of and this is an interesting approach actually. What kind of consideration has been given to the fact that an external aid such as a Garmin may reinforce behaviors that the car is masking? So. Obviously, we're talking about using technology as part of the instructing process, but and there are a lot of comments. You know, you see it all the time on the on the sites that we look at in terms of the car nannies and the things of of not allowing the driver to teach properly. So, um, just asking if you know is is the data system doing the same thing? Uh, to to me, the data systems are providing feedback to the driver. 
and uh, and ultimately it's really no different than an instructor in the car giving that feedback. So can it mask somebody doing something wrong? I'm going to say the answer to that is absolutely no different than if an instructor misses it or tells them the wrong thing. I mean, yeah. the, the one thing that technology is really good at is it's black and white. <laughs> you know, it, if, if it's, uh, if it's the right thing to do, it's going to tell them the right thing to do. Um, you know, the, the whole conversation on when do we, you know, when do we turn off stability control systems or not turn off stability? That's all, you know, a massive yeah. other topic that we're not going to get into tonight. Um, yeah, no. Do another webinar. So, yeah. Yeah, no, but it was just kind of tied in with all the technology. Uh, yeah, yeah. Bit, so. I, I, you know, I, I, there's a danger in, in trusting and relying on technology too much. But I think it's just as dangerous to kind of go, well, I don't trust that. And we shouldn't be using that. Um, yeah. Uh, there are tools out there that we should be using. I really should. Yep. Yep. Another note, um, I'll grab a quick answer to one of the questions that came up earlier. Um, all the documentation uh, that Ross posted up will be listed under the resources page on the Motorsport Safety website, uh, motorsport-safety.org. I'll pop that up there, but we'll put those documents up there as well for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John had asked, uh, what do you think the, sp the split is between instructors that really enjoy it and strike for excellence versus those who are just saving a few bucks? I'm not sure I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna attempt to answer that question. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is. Uh, my my experience has been because for so many years I've been going around to different organizations around the country, for profit and nonprofit, and there I I can show up and it doesn't take long to kind of get a feel for the culture of the organization, and you can tell when. The majority, if not all, the instructors are there for the student, and then every now and then you you see an organization where you kind of get the feeling that they're kind of going through the paces here, and it's for the cheap track time. So uh, I'm going to say it's in the, it's in fortunately it's in the minority, but you know uh, it's out there. I you know I've done uh, instructor workshops and I've said why do you instruct? And I get people saying you know it's me giving back and it's all this, and then you know. Every now and then, one of the very first comments is, I get cheaper track, ta track time. And I was like, okay, well, I know why you're really here. If it's the first thing out of your mouth. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, oh, Ben asked this question. Um, I have seen students ride with an instructor and then get back in their car and drive over their ability and get into trouble. Any tips to keep this from happening? Um, so Ben, first of all, uh, I'm with you. Like I think often instructors are too, um, they're too quick to say, hey, let me show you how fast I can drive around this track or let me show you how quick your car can go, whatever, right? Now, having just actually done this with somebody at Button Willow a couple of weeks ago or a week or so ago, there is a time and a place where you get the sense that if the driver just saw just a little taste of, oh, the car is capable of that, the driver will get more confidence or feel like uh, or get a feel for, oh, that's what the car feels like when it's doing that. When that happens, um, sometimes there is a breakthrough there. But I also believe that um, there are often too many instructors who are trying to do that too quickly, too soon. And, um, you know, you're asking any tips to keep this from happening. It comes back to the instructor knowing how quickly to drive the car. If, if, um, uh, if you don't want the student to drive too fast, then don't drive too fast. So it really comes back, I think, to you in the beginning to not overdrive that part of it. Um, Art asked, Ross, have you ever felt like getting into an argument? 
what are you thinking, Art? I think you're wrong. <laughs> Why would I want to get an argument? <laughs> Sorry, it sounds like a Monty Python skit there again. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. Have you ever felt like getting into an argument? Yes. How's that for an answer? Uh, Peter, how does the Garmin know adjust for the type of car? Uh, well, you tell it what car you have, but and I'm not the. Uh, I only understand the outside of how it works, but I, I, I believe how it works is it just observes your behavior, and I don't know if it cares what car you're in, um, because it's only telling you to do better what it's seen you already do inconsistently. So um, I think it just has you load your car in there, not because it has a database with a bunch of vehicle dynamics, but just so you can keep track if you change cars or you have multiple cars. It doesn't know what car you're driving. All it knows yeah. is what you have done and then works from there. So, hey, Brian B asked a question that was interesting. At what point does the student need to get kicked out of the nest and go solo? Um, first of all, interesting way, <laughs> interesting way of putting it. Uh, uh, you know, I think every organization has sort of different standards for that. And, you know, the, the first response would be whatever your organization has for guidelines around that. Uh, some use uh, driver valve or different types of uh, forms that are, they have to reach, you know, tick that box off. They've got to be at a certain level of this, being able to demonstrate this. So there's different um, levels in that. Ultimately, I think it comes down to when a student is seen to be safe, reasonably consistent, aware and uh but still have things to learn but they're going to learn more on their own than they will with that person sitting in the right seat with them giving them directions i i'd say that's sort of the general philosophical way of that's around the guidelines and again different organizations have different ways of of picking that point some it's just a you know some lead chief instructor gets in and goes for a, a checkout ride some it's a, got a system with a, you know, certain evaluations and things. And I, I like that last one a little more. So, cause it's a process. So. Hey, Ross, yeah. a really good, a really good one came in from Christian. He says, as an instructor in an organization, how do you get buy-in from the others in the organization that are, are struggling to adopt new techniques? Almost uh, the impossible question, but it's a really good one. <laughs> I highly recommend the the big baseball bat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, you know, again, I would I would say, um, you know, so much of that depends on the culture that's in the organization. And if the culture is around constant improvement, you know, the I'm not going to say the sales of that of of selling this new program is gonna, ever going to be easy, but I think it's easier if that's the case. So it may be some of one of those things where, um, you know, it's a, it's a long-term process of changing the culture, but, uh, you know, more simple, I guess it's again, trickle it out, kind of go, Hey, this year we're going to add one component and we're going to do this. And maybe, you know, when they see the result of that, Oh, let's add one more thing like that. So just to start to trickle it out to me, it's no different than the, the model of, trickling out information about driving to our students before they even get to the track. If, if instructors show up at the track and the chief instructor goes, okay, instructors, we're changing everything. You know how that's going to go over. But if you've trickled it out over time and there's been some communication and, you know, you're kind of gradually slowly getting that buy-in and maybe you're asking them for an input and maybe some of the, the ideas become theirs. Hopefully that makes a difference. Yeah. Well, I mean, part of part of why we're doing this type of a webinar is, you know, for the last call it whatever, seven to eight months, cultures had to change anyway. Right. Like it's part of part of part of introducing this this new method and and talking through it and kind of discussing it and showing the, the flow chart and everything is because a lot of folks are, are making changes now anyway, because they have to because of the environment that we're in. So, um, you know, it's kind of in my mind, I think the timing is a little bit right 
you know, in terms of thinking about things, because you're, you're being forced to think about things in a different way, regardless, because of, because of the COVID situation, truthfully. And going back to the, you know, sort of the, the intro to this whole webinar was, you know, we know that we, we've learned more about how people learn. So that's one thing. We now have access to technology that allows us to do things that we couldn't even three years ago. And our world is different today. So yeah, um, for sure, I think those things have an impact on hopefully getting the buy-in that you need. Yep, absolutely. Uh, you have any more questions there? Because no, some. I'm I'm pretty much full up. Uh, I've kind of gone through everything I have have seen. I will say one of our uh, one of our past guests on one of our webinars, Steve Libby, has made the the offer for uh, Peter to come join him at the Puget Sound BMW. So. Uh, <laughs> Love to do that. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, okay, got a, a, a few more here, and some of some of like great comments, like Brian's. Is there an HPD for dummies book? Someone someone is publishing. Um, definitely for the dummies. Uh, we we need that <laughs> as a as a group. Um, I say that jokingly, right? Uh, uh, Chris said, I found it very difficult to get instructor training. Our local PTA yes. NASA group canceled all training this past season. Are there groups training instructors using non-in-person methods? Uh, very interesting, Chris. I mean, first off, um, I, I'm going to use this as a, as a little um, wave out here to everybody and say, if you are doing instructor training programs, anybody listening to this, please let us know as MSF, please let us know because we publish that, Scott, you've got a system for getting that information out there. And, yep. you know, we, we want to do, we want to do that even better. So please, if you're doing that, um, are there groups that are doing our training instructors in a kind of a non in-person method? Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, Steve Libby, um, the, BMW CCA Puget Sound. Uh, I did a session for him on Zoom. Steve, I can't remember when that was back in May or something like that. I can't remember exactly when we did that. So there are organizations who are doing that. I did a did a talk for a PCA region online with Zoom this year. So I, I think you know there are a lot of um, opportunities and. You know what? I've been doing instructor training programs for many, many years. And one of the things that I always say is the some of the most effective, best training that ever happens is when a group of instructors share their experiences. And often, you know, it's at the end of the day, one instructor says, you know, man, I've really struggled with this student today. And then this happened and I got through or I didn't get through. And another instructor says, hey, did you try this? And it's sharing that information that is, I think, some of the best training for instructors there is. And so I would encourage anybody that's in a in a role to help do that, to facilitate that. You know, hey, we're, our lives are all about uh, when's our next Zoom meeting, right? Set up a Zoom meeting for your instructors. And if all it is is everybody get together, share best practices, um, you know, when Eric Meyer uh, put that uh, instructor summit program at Indy back in February of this year, uh, pre COVID, um, or at least pre lockdown, that was the whole kind of the, the main message was we're here to share experiences and learn from each other, best practices. So, um, that's a really, really good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, yeah. And just following up on the, on the training, so just so everybody knows, we post that, <clears throat> excuse me, we post that on the, the MSF HPDE page on our website. And then also anytime anybody gives us any information on instructor training, we'll also post that to our MSF Facebook page as well um, and sh shed that around. So anybody that has that training and wants, you know, wants to work on getting new instructors and to publish that, let us know. And uh, there's a contact uh, page on the website as well that people can send us an email. Um, and reach out to us, but it's it's good that we can spread the word on that stuff. Uh, and and we've had so many questions and comments. It's sort of we're 
slightly out of control there and we're getting close to our deadline here. But uh, Chris had kind of a question comment actually, I think is it's related back to the lap time thing. Is it realistic to main, maintain no lap times for intermediate and advanced HPDE? If you're learning to push by analyzing data, you've got to be paying attention to lap times, dot, dot, dot. Uh, yeah, Chris, that's kind of what I'm saying is, I don't, I, I think it's unrealistic to say that we're, that people are not going to be using lap times because they've got a smartphone or a data system or something, you know, a video camera records lap times now. So um, it's happening. I think if, if the thinking is, you know, it's against the rules, maybe just check those rules and find out either you're not playing within those rules by expecting your street insurance to cover you or, um, um, or you're, you're, you don't know what those rules exactly are. So uh, take a look into that. Uh, oh, Jacob, this is a tough question. <laughs> this conversation is about how aspects of our instructions meet and fail the expectations of our students. How do we make more success? Magic wand. <laughs> I highly recommend the magic one. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think I kind of know where you're coming from here is just, you know, but, but I think I'm, I think what you're kind of saying is the more of this we put together and, you know, this is that maybe it's at this point in these webinars where I kind of go, how many people signed up? This is incredible. How cool is it that this many instructors care this much about doing a better job as instructors that they just committed this amount of time to being on here tonight. So thanks for doing that. Um, yeah. That's first. And then I think, you know, part of our job, you know, part of Scott and Peter and everybody else that's been helping with these MSF webinars, part of our job is to make you think. And as instructors, I think part of our job is to make our students think. And if all we do is tell them, do this, do this, do this, are we really making them think? So when we start to do more lead follow, maybe we're getting them to think. When we start to get them to think about going out to a corner and watching and asking, why is that driver doing that? We're making them think. So part of this model is, again, to build a, a, a culture around, we're here to make you think, and it's it's constant improvement. Okay, we have any more questions that we need to get to? Um, oh, this one was, uh, show me some in-car application footage. Bill, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we need to do more of that in, uh, when we get into the details of, of some of this stuff too, so. Uh, um, and that's kind of related to that. And somebody's asking about a replay with the Garmin stuff. Is it easy to move to car to car? Yes. How can communication between student and coach be best utilized? Clearly. Well timed. Um, appropriate. Uh, how can communication between student and coach be best utilized? I'm not sure how, how to answer that question. How do I answer that question? Peter, Scott? I don't know. I mean, there's been some conversations in the comments about, um, you know, using radios for lead follow and some of the things like that. I, I don't know if that's where they're kind of leaning towards or, or what the actual, what the actual basis for that is. But um, I know that's come up in a number of places and it seems like, I mean, you know, based on what, what some of the, a lot of the comments we've seen here um, it almost seems like, you know, a, a future webinar could be, you know, a little bit, a little bit more related to data um, and how maybe how to use data. And I think that's the perfect place where we go out and get Andrew Rains from Apex Pro and grab some of the other guys and Peter Krause and some of those guys. And maybe that's something we do just to kind of walk through um, some of the information to, to talk about this difference between lap times and not lap times and improvement and non-improvement and some of the other areas and comments that have come up here. So maybe that's another, another place for us to add to our list, Ross, our, our ever growing list. Our ever growing list that, you know, again, if we're going to take over Netflix. Exactly. We got, we got to get more content out there. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, um, and uh, Danny had asked, and I think you kind of touched on this, but uh, Danny had asked, can we get the slides? Yes. Those slides will be posted up on the MSF site. Uh, 
James had, had uh, comment question of, I have found students are more responsive to data than a human instructor's subjective comments. That's really interesting comment. That's uh, um, in, in, you know, some of that I think depends on the relationship between the instructor and student and, and how pe some people learn. You know, I've had conversations with people and, you know, it's like, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. You show them a data squiggly line, they go, oh, I can go do that. So, you know, that's part of our job as instructors is to use the tool. And that's why, you know, they're just more tools for us. And Rowan had asked, uh, when will you do a driver's aid webinar? I'm assuming that's a driver's aids in terms of traction control, stability control. Um, so you said you said we could do a whole webinar on that. So that's what got that fired up. That's what happened. Silly me. <laughs> you, you put it out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's do that. I, I've I have done a number of during seminars, workshops for different uh, instructor training programs. I have touched on that topic and talked about that topic. So um, I guess we could do one just on that. It, it yeah. It's it's a tough topic because it's there's no simple answer. So no. So I think um, I think we've pretty much covered the bulk of the questions. I'm sure we've missed somebody's question. If, if you've got a specific question that didn't get answered tonight, uh, well, I'll tell, I'll, I'll be, I'll say, you know, you can email me at info at speedsecrets.com and ask the question. Scott, I don't know whether you want to share your email address, but. Uh, no, that's fine. It's the same thing. We've got a contact at motorsport-safety.org that people can use. So yeah, just use that. And again, if there's any kind of question or anything that comes up or you need the link to the replay or whatever it is that, uh, that they're interested in, use that and, and reach out to us. Yep. So Ross, thank you very much. Peter, thank you very much. I feel like this has been informative and uh, again, you know, great for the comments and great for everybody to, to participate. We're grateful that we get the participation that we get and uh, hopefully that we can keep building and adding resources for the community. Um, and, and just be, that, that's really what the Motorsport Safety Foundation wants to do. In addition to the certified program, we want to start creating these resources that everyone can have access to and have the ability to use and just make our community and make our sport a better place. Thank you. So with that, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, and I um, hope everybody has, is, stays safe and uh, doesn't eat too, eat too much turkey like usual. So or not turkey or tofurkey or whatever, depending on your, your, uh, your tastes. So uh, thanks again, Ross. Thanks again, Peter. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Okay.